If you don't like this country, why don't you just leave? Have you ever seen someone tweet that? Well, in 1861, the South did just that, and they took their states with them. But did you know that another small group of disgruntled Southerners then decided to secede from the country that had just seceded from the United States? Today, we'll be talking to Victoria Bynum about the free state of Jones, its creation, and the long-term consequences of its existence. This is too complicated for history. so much for being with us today, Vicki. I just have to say that I really enjoy your book, uh, Free State of Jones. And in fact, you came up in a previous podcast episode. We had Marcus Nevius, Dr. Marcus P. Nevius on, and he is the author of a book about petite marinage in the Great Dismal Swamp. And it was absolutely fascinating. And I was trying to think of something that something else that I knew similar to this, this idea of petite marinage. And the only thing that came to my mind was the free state of Jones. And I said, oh my goodness, that's what you're talking about. It's the same idea, right? And he, he agreed. He said that it's pretty much the same concept. It's just, of course, in a, in a different location. Um, and of course, I also brought the movie because I enjoyed seeing that as well. Um, but so I'm very excited to have you here today and to talk about your book and what exactly all of this stuff means. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, my first introduction to this topic of of deserters and and uh, collaboration between deserters and slaves was in North Carolina. So the Dismal Swamp was an area where that sort of collaboration really, really did go on to, I think, an even larger extent. But uh, in Mississippi, it would have been on the Pearl River uh, and the Leaf River were that sort of interactions between Maroons and uh, deserters. Uh, it's great in the slave narratives. They talk about it in there, some of the, uh, the ex-slaves. So thank you for having me. It's a, I'm, I'm just, I love seeing this interest in this topic. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And one of, one of the reasons we wanted to chat with you is, uh, so I you obviously haven't listened to any of the episodes of the podcast because it's not out yet. But one of the things that I'm always doing is comparing things to modern cultural references. So oftentimes it, because I'm a filmmaker, it ends up being movies. Uh, and your work actually has been adapted relatively recently. Um, and just to, for those who aren't familiar with your book, The Free State of Jones or the movie, um, could you just describe a little bit about what it is? Like what's the story of what, what, uh, what your work covers? What The Free State of Jones is? Yes. Itself? Yeah. Uh, well, it, it uh, refers to an inner civil war, uh, an insurrection, uh, by uh, a, really a large number of people in Jones County who were well organized, well armed, and taking on the Confederacy. They were they were anti Confederate and they were pro Union as well. Not all of these inner civil wars specifically involved a uh, majority of Unionists. Sometimes you just have people who did not want to fight in the war anymore. And in fact, uh, I would say the Free State of Jones is a combination of people with a variety of motives. Most of them, and many of them just plain not wanting to die, not wanting their families just to starve on the home front. Uh, but the core of it, the core of it, uh, and the organizers of it, and the leader, Newt Knight, uh, were all avowed uh, supporters of the U.S. government and U.S. Army. And they fought right there in the swamps. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, I read your afterward, the new one. I'm not sure when this edition of the book was published. Um, it was right around the time the movie started filming, I believe. Yeah, 2016. Yeah. Um, and I have a new afterword in that that discusses the movie. Is that the one you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. 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 And I, I thought it was interesting in it because you, uh, you make a couple of references to the lost cause. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that comes up often when we're, you know, when talking about the Civil War is, is, not the idea of not all Southerners, this, that, and the other. But then it w what I found cool about this book is that this is those people. Yeah, yes, that's true. But they weren't necessarily, you know, Confederates that, you know, w weren't involved in, you know, that directly in enslavement. It was, you know, a lot of them were unionists. 
there was a fair, uh, a good number, I'd say even more than a fair number. And these unionists were really erased by the, the lost cause histories that began to come out in the late 19th century. And in fact, they weren't totally erased when they, when, when their presence just couldn't be denied, they were basically referred to as, as treasonist, uh, poor, poor whites, uh, low class people, and they were just denigrated. Treasonous uh, was was often uh, hurled at them. And uh, what was interesting about Jones County is that uh, the the unionist core uh, that I mentioned earlier, people like Newt Knight and Jasper Collins, and uh, they continued to defend themselves. Right up, I mean, Jasper Collins died in 1913, and he defended himself as a unionist right till his death. So I think that's one of the reasons why. The free state of Jones has had more staying power. It 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 sort of, you know, there were like historians and folklorists and literary people that constantly wanted to bring back this free state of Jones story, this odd little story, and they didn't always get it right. But it's interesting that the story was never forgotten, and I think that's because its unionist stalwarts refused to capitulate to the lost cause, refused to go along with it, and. Uh, the last interview that Jasper Collins had before his death in 1913, he was saying he and the others with him refused to fight a war over slavery. They refused to fight a war that was to save slavery. And to say that in the midst of the lost cause was, was quite, uh, quite, quite bold on his part. But, you know, so many of it, there were, there were a lot of inner civil wars in different states, North Carolina, of course, a major one. And many of those people simply quit talking about it. Their families did. It was especially, you know, as the lost cause started to emerge as the pro-Confederate view of the Civil War as having not been about slavery at all, having been caused by just, you know, constitutional principles, states' rights, and uh, simultaneous with that version of the Civil War not being about slavery, you get this whole uh, rewriting of Reconstruction as having been a time when uh, ignorant, animalistic blacks took over our government. And of course, I mean, the, uh, the uh, Birth of a Nation movie in 1915, mm-hmm. the portrayal of the black congressmen in that with their feet on the table, eating fried chicken, that sort of thing. I mean, it's just uh, absolutely uh, uh, destroyed the whole understanding of the Civil War from the point of view of the Unionists who had fought against the, the Confederacy itself. So it's no wonder that they themselves retreated. So many of them just retreated, never spoke of it again. Uh, but in Jones County, uh, they did. And they, and it might be somewhat because of the isolation of Jones County that they, they've all, they have a kind of an anti-authoritarian reputation that still survives mm-hmm. today. And it seems to me like part of that was, no, we're not backing down from who we were. This is who we were. Huh. Yeah, and just for those who are unfamiliar with sort of the historical arc of the lost cause, 1913, to be giving an interview like that is like, that's the pinnacle of it. There's a lost causer in the White House at that point, I believe. When did that's right. Like yep. Right. Like it is the predominant narrative of what happened exactly. there. They won the, the sort of the, the PR battle at that point. Oh, absolutely. So for Jasper Collins to be go doing an interview was sort of very anti-mainstream. Yeah. Well, yeah, President Wilson uh, referred to uh, the birth of a nation, which only comes out two years after uh, that interview with Jasper Collins. He refers to it as like written history, written like lightning. Isn't that the I'm paraphrasing badly, but he loved it. Yeah, oh, he was yeah. right there. It with was his it. favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the big thing. It's like, oh, it was screened in the White House. My goodness. But it was, you know, a fantastic thing at the time. That's the way they perceived. It. Right. That's how the Wilson administration perceived it. And, yeah. you know, Wilson himself. Exactly. And sort of on that that line of that line of ideas, you had said that, you know, this this story, it sort of has staying power. So it's always been around. But what I'm wondering is, was it accurately portrayed or was it being used sort of as propaganda? Did you find that people on both sides were trying to twist it to make a case, maybe to make a case for the lost cause or to make a case for the South having pro-unionists? Or do you think that there was any sort of correct or more accurate portrayal of of this event? Yeah, it's a great question. And it was one of the most interesting experiences I had uh, was going into all the all of the articles, books, whatever that had been written about it and and watching that process. And when the when during the period of the late 19th century, really 
the lost cause is beginning to come about, but it hasn't really emerged yet. The 1880s, you get this Gene Norton Galloway, um, a northerner who had fought for the Union Army. And it's said uh, that one of the first essays I read, he doesn't even get Newt Knight's name right. He calls him Nathan Knight. But he presented them as just savages, poor white mm-hmm. savages, savages. And so here you have a northerner who really loves the idea that you got all these white Southerners rising up against the Confederacy, but he wants to present them as savages because he's got another motive as well. He wants people to know that this is what slavery did to white people in the South who were not slaveholders. Look at them, they're savages. So mm. it's not, there's nothing complimentary in it for, for these men that I've been talking about, Jasper Collins and Newton Knight. And in fact, what it really stimulates is some of their relatives of the men who had been a part of the Knight Company is they start, uh, you know, they start, for one thing, denying the central premise uh, of Galloway's essay that they had, that uh, Jones County had actually seceded from the Confederacy. That's mm-hmm. one of the enduring myths is that they actually mm-hmm. wrote up papers of secession that sort of echoed the South secession, only they were seceding from Mississippi or from the Confederacy. Well, they refuted that because that wasn't true. The way they saw it is they had, their county had never seceded. Their county uh-huh. had voted against secession gotcha. and, uh, and, 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 Therefore, they weren't going to fight for a cause that they didn't believe in. And so you you get this very uh, belittling kind of uh, storytelling by the North, by by northern former abolitionists. uh, And even the Nation magazine picks it up and pretty much repeats the Galloway story. But they go a little softer. They start presenting them as noble savages. You know, they're still... Poor ignorant, <laughs> but they're noble. noble. You know, but no, nobody could handle the idea that these these people, these families, because their their wives were often articulate unionists as well. Mm-hmm. Nobody could handle the idea that these people had a political ideology and that it was grounded in their in their class relations with the slaveholders. That uh, they knew they had figured out what was going on, that their lives were on the line, and uh, they did not want to fight for this so-called cause, and they knew that slavery was the cause of of the Civil War. That understanding really is buried uh, for for so long. It's kind of amazing because once you get through this period where the abolitionists are saying, look at those white savages down there that slavery created, then you get into the lost cause, and there it's just, they're either erased or, as I said earlier, they're just ignorant, treasonous, that sort of thing. And then by the period of World War One, going into that period of the Red Scare, it it they kind of get lumped in with, uh, well, the Klan emerges, mm-hmm. racism, right. Right. and so these are people that they they get uh, kind of merged with uh, all of the negative images of of blacks, of freedmen, and all of that sort of thing. Uh, these these white unionists are no better than the, than the black men that served with them in Congress, that sort of thing. And uh, it's really not until the 1930s to the Great Depression where you actually get a Jones County newspaper then that starts to laud the free state of Jones, uses the term, talks about Newton Knight, and basically they're now taking a class position uh, in society against the uh, industrial you know, corporations and this, and this sort of thing, and the businesses that they are uh, organizing labor against. And now Newt Knight kind of emerges finally as a hero, uh, as someone who recognized uh, the exploitation of the common man. And the common man to them is not so much the poor white as the small landowner. Uh, right, someone who maybe owns one or two enslaved people, not like the large plantations. Right. That, right. That, yeah. And they make that point that this this county was not a slaveholding county. Mm-hmm. We had very few slaves here and we had no stake in the war. And so uh, and then Newt Knight's son during that decade also writes uh, a, a biography of his father. But it's very complicated by the fact that he could not handle the fact that his father had crossed the color line and had had many mixed race children. Tom was mm-hmm. the son of Newt Knight's legal wife, his white wife, mm-hmm. uh, and he was one of the children who did not intermarry with the mixed-race children 
of Rachel Knight. This gets very complicated. I might not want to go into it right now, but I'm just to say that Tom Knight had problems <laughs> That's with his our father's title. crossing of yeah. the facial line. What? Yeah. It's complicated even in the for the people who it was complicated for. Right. That's why we love <laughs> yeah. it, because it's complicated. Yeah. Every time I find myself going into it, it's like I think... Vicky, don't do that right now. You know, you're, you're going to change the subject so dramatically. But uh, so to get back to it, that Tom Knight wrote a kind of a worshipful history of his dad that left out the very important element of also race mixing and the fact that his father had lived until the day he died in a racially mixed community of his own making. And he was the patriarch of it. But still in all, you, you begin to see Newt Knight coming back as a hero and uh you know, once that gets into the 1940s, and, and it, it's interesting how this story, this story always takes shape in the historical moment that is revived right. in. Right. Always. Yeah. And I guess all important stories are going to have that, that uh, result. And so as the civil rights movement begins to gain some traction in the 1940s, you start seeing uh, certain prominent segregationists going after Newt Knight. They portray him as a, as, as a, as a drunkard, uh, as a working class drunkard to try to sort of uh, use him to, to uh, denigrate unions, labor unions. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting from civil war unionist to labor unionist, you know, it's always that word union in there that he's, <laughs> yeah. he gets associated with. Uh, and that's and so finally, interesting that he got like the story of him get, has two reasons to be sort of flattened or written out of the U S it's one of one from the racial sort of trajectory, the racial history of the United States, but also from the class history of the United States. Like yes, the, the, both exactly. of those get very flattened. And, and that's funny that he it yeah. sort of, it crosses the border on both of those. Yeah. Uh, really and uh, Lynn, you had asked me earlier, was there anybody who kind of got it right, right. earlier on? Yeah. And there yeah. was one real, I mean, James Street. He, James Street was mm -hmm. from the Jones County area. I think he was from a different county, but very near that area. Uh, he'd grown up hearing all about Newt Knight all his life. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a journalist and also, uh, I don't know what his degree was in, but he wrote quite a bit of history. And he wrote novels. And Taproots was the novel he wrote that was that was loosely, very loosely based on, on Newt Knight. And he says so in the introduction that it was inspired by, by Newt Knight and the Free State of Jones. And so it's a novel. So, of course, much of it has changed, but the essence of it, and he wrote about this in a few other uh, articles that he wrote, he, he gets it, he really gets it right. This is about class. This is about uh, men who have no, who, who come to realize if they didn't realize it from the beginning that they don't have a stake in this war uh, and they're not going to fight it. And Newt Knight in the uh, 1890s, I, I just love this amazing interview with him in the 1890s where he's looking back and saying, we should have just risen up and killed the slaveholders. I mean, oh, I don't wow. love anybody being murdered, but I love the fact <laughs> that Newt Knight later in life became, really, he, he he saw that only a revolution of the society, Whether and, and he talks about the Underground Railroad, so it sounds like he even means an interracial one, but mm -hmm. I don't want to put words in his mouth. But he does mention how the Underground Railroad and Northern women abolitionists have been, you know, writing about this. And I just thought that was uh, just such a remarkable thing for him to say. He tried to work with the, with the Union Army, mm -hmm. and they let him down. They never compensated him or his men, 55 men. He he applied for compensation for from 1870 to 1900. They never got a dime. And by 1900, by the time, or I should say 1890, by the time you get to the end of the cycle of him trying to get compensation for them having fought on the side of the Union, his organized band of men, uh, by the time you get to that point, even many Northerners are buying into the lost cause. You know, they're also saying, right. How? you know, these people just want money. You know, there's a depression going on. Mm -hmm. They just want money. We're not, you know, and uh, you read the transcript of the uh, government kind of a trial that they gave him or, you know, they, they came in and they came to Ellisville and, and they had lawyers on either side. And, and they basically, uh, you know, put people on the stand and uh, grilled them. And it really it really is a case where the U.S. government of all sides of this is uh, trying to undermine all the testimony in his favor. And I'm sure that, that that had some effect on sending Newt Knight to, to that point that he was in in that 1890s revolution where he says we should have just risen up 
and overthrowing the slaveholders. Yeah, isn't it always a bummer when when people who feel like should know better, like the the one of the complaints of generally the one of the driving forces of the lost cause as a, as a historical narrative is the condescension of the North. Uh, and, and what you're describing is several instances of them specifically, you know, of Newt Knight's story getting caught in that flack. It's like, that was real. They did. We're condescending. They were they, in the way that they were approaching their, the, the way yeah. people looked at it. I think that's, that's a real important point. And that you, that's what I really saw in that trial. Uh, the ones, I mean, where they, they actually uh, insulted him during the, uh, you know, the, the back and forth when they were, when he was testifying and they were asking questions and, uh, you know, his relationship with Adelbert Ames, well, why didn't Adelbert Ames, the, you know, the radical reconstruction governor, why didn't he just uh, give you the money and you have Newt Knight coming back and he says, well, I reckon he didn't think he was the government. You know, I mean, he has a better <laughs> sense of, you know, what we're talking about here, of, you know, oh yeah, right. The governor's just going to hand us a, a, you know, a stack of money. You know? Right, right. But that was the kind of insulting little asides that, that, hmm. that got thrown at him. And you're right. They, they were very condescending. And just as those articles in the 1880s and 1890s in the Nation magazine, as well as yeah. uh, uh, Gene Norton Galloway's, it just, they could not believe that uh, there could be political consciousness among ordinary uh, landowning farmers. Well, and I love that your book focuses on class because I feel like that's something that's lost not only in Civil War history, but in, in American history in general. But I think even now we lump together, we'll say North and South. All of all of the Northerners were anti-slavery, um, pro-union. All yeah. of the Southerners were all about, you know, they were they all had a lot of slaves. And in fact, it's actually a very small percentage of Southerners who had the most, you know, the majority of the enslaved people in the South. Right. It's really tiny when you get into the, right. the big slaveholders that we think of as plantations. I think 25 percent own slaves, but the vast majority of them have fewer than than five slaves. And I mean, it's still slavery. I'm not at all diminishing that. But in terms of where the wealth is. Yeah, right. we think everyone's, you know, the. Uh, Oh, gone with the wind. We picture every single person in the South, you know, right. gone with the wind. Right. And another thing that I remember when I learned that really shocked me was that if you had a certain number of enslaved people, you could get out of fighting the war. So not only is the the war benefiting you the most because you're the one, it's it's about your wealth, but then because you're wealthy, you don't have to go and actually participate in the fight. And I think that's why the the rich man's war, poor man's fight sort of became the saying. And I think it really highlights who was fighting this war, but who was really going to benefit from, from exactly. the war. Exactly. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. That's certainly the way they saw it and the way I see it as well, uh, that... Uh, you know, in North Carolina, which has better records of the common people and the uprisings against uh, the Confederacy there in the, uh, in the central part of North Carolina that I looked at, the Piedmont, the letters from women were just incredible to wise. I mean, you know, they hmm. because they talked graphically about, uh, you know, the Confederate troops uh, coming in or whole divisions coming in and just taking, you know, on their tithes, uh, tax in kind. Uh, and the people, I mean, many of the people who didn't have a political view came to have one in the during the war because of the way they were treated uh and by their own army yes essentially exactly. yeah 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 i'm curious it's, uh, you were talking about how um the story sort of takes on the the shape of where, where like whatever era it kind of gets brought up in mm -hmm. and is there any time so in between you know the civil rights movement and now is does the story see any play like in, in sort of like the popular imagination or any like is I'm, I'm thinking specifically of, Oh, like I can see like a connections to some Vietnam protests that were happening in the early, like late sixties, early seventies. Um, was it at all part of the consciousness then, or was it sort of, I, I remember seeing a letter written that somebody had reproduced and it was during the Vietnam war protests. And, and there was somebody in the, who had written a letter about the free state of Jones, that this is a long mm -hmm. tradition you know, of protesting wars, that it's, it's, uh, it, it's not the, it's not the first time that people yeah. have risen up and said, you know, this war is, is not in my interest. I'm not, I'm not going to fight. It's a, it's an immoral war, you mm -hmm. know, because 
I mean, when are soldiers ever told the real reason they're fighting a war? And I'm not equating all wars, but it's just, you know, as having, you know, the same corrupt causes. But uh, but certainly uh, governments generally don't don't say, well, you know, we really shouldn't be doing this. We're only going to do it. We're only doing <laughs> right. it for our, our own, you know, our own wealth. But uh, you're going to go fight it, you know. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, there's a long, long tradition stretching as far back as this country goes for, you know, the, the soldiers getting the, the people who are actually doing the fight and getting the short end of the stick, uh, basically, you know. Well, it, and unfortunately, you know, when, when, when this story should have been coming out in the civil rights movement, which you mentioned when you first uh, formed your question, instead, mm-hmm. uh, a certain uh, grandniece of Newt Knight, who was very, very pro-Confederate, because the family, the Knight family, like many families in Jones County and the South in general, were divided. You know, they, they had their slaveholding so- branches and they had their non-slaveholding branches. And she came from the slaveholding branch. And, and of course, Newt Knight was just a, you know, a black mark on their family, uh, as much because he crossed the color line as, as fought against the Confederacy. So mm-hmm. she got out there in 1951 and equated uh, Newt Knight, uh, you know, with uh, with with communism. That's <laughs> Cold War. I don't know how you get a communist, <laughs> but but it, communism and tra- trees because of treason against one's nation is mm-hmm. what she right, saw right. American communists as being treasonous and just like Newt Knight was. And then segregation, of course, she saw that as just a repeating of what Newt Knight had done. So he was uh, he was uh, disloyal to both his race and his country. Uh, and she she sees that story. And in fact, her book has gone through more printings. It's still being printed today regularly. Uh, and I met her before death. She lived to be uh, over 100 years old. And, wow. you know, we, we did have a civil conversation, although she told me she would sue me if I <laughs> used Newt Knight's name. Uh, <laughs> it was just a kind of a... It, she probably was just trying to scare me, but her, her <laughs> point work. was that she had rights to Newt Knight because she had written The Echo of the Black Horn is the book. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, you know, it's one of those books that I'm so lucky was written because it's got so many of the old stories in it and things that mm-hmm. I could then go to the records and check out. Yes. But it's also uh, a pro-segregation, a pro-segregation uh, very racist. Uh, and that book has dominated Jones County for so many decades that oftentimes when I would go to interview people, they would say to me, well, and I would realize they were just quoting from the book. Mm -hmm. And they would even say sometimes, well, I think Ethel got it right. That, I mean, it really does show you, here you see an important uprising, uh, unionist uprisings really throughout the South in various pockets of the South. And you really see some change coming. You see reconstruction. These guys were all, I mean, the, the unionists, they were given mm-hmm. powerful positions in the immediate after during radical reconstruction. Mm-hmm. And then right. you see it all overturned during the lost cause. Yeah. And to me, it's this is what's so important about studying history in all its elements and all its phases is that you see how really promising change uh, to uh, and, and, and fundamental change being brought to a system that had included slavery for for all of the you know before the American Revolution, and yeah. it's it's overturned through law, through propaganda, through mm-hmm. violence more than anything. You start with the violence, but you got the law behind you in the South. You know, you just and and then you've got the propaganda of things like Birth of a Nation and right. all right. of these popular stories. Ethel Knight's book, which mm-hmm. is really a repetition of Birth of a Nation, that that seem to have been her Bible. And it, so to me, it's, it's, it's both a hopeful and a tragic story because of that. And I guess historians are always looking for that. Like this is a what if story, you know, uh, I think that, that uh, is just a really important one uh, to American history for that reason, for those reasons. It's interesting, you know, that there's that old cliche that the history is written by the winners. Mm -hmm. Um, The civil war in my own conception, is one that is not true. Absolutely. Yeah. That, I agree where with we that. have the history written by the losers. Yep. That's Weirdly absolutely enough. true. It's, it's, kind, it's really, uh, well, it's, it's tragic, uh, but it was, and they succeeded. And, I mean, when you even heard, I, I remember about maybe not quite a decade ago, maybe about eight years ago, but, but Hillary Clinton was repeating Reconstruction dogma without even realizing it. Oh, she didn't wow. mean to. I mean, but she was repeating it. You know, it was like, uh, you know, when we had ignorant people, you know, the government, 
corruption. Wait a minute. No, no, no. That's lost cause stuff. Yeah. That's why right. we need to learn our history, right? What's right. That? That's why we need to learn our history. Yes, that's exactly right. And reconstruction <laughs> as much as the Civil War. So often, oh, as absolutely. Teachers, we often, we all complain about it. Uh, if you don't start, you know, if you don't put reconstruction on there and then you just go ahead and stop with the Civil War, oh, the North won, and then you go on in, in 1310 or, you know, the, 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 the first half and you start it all over again. It's like, you're missing no half wonder, the story. Yeah. The, no wonder there's so little understanding of Reconstruction. Right. It was. Yeah. I mean, there was a counter revolution against the revolution of the war. Yeah. And they won. And just like you said, and then they rewrote yep. history. They, and they won the propaganda war. Yeah. 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 I have a joke with Lynn about <laughs> the like the general understanding of American history is like okay, so we were colonies. Then um, there was the war, the Revolutionary War. Then the Constitution and uh, um, the Declaration of Independence are the same thing. <laughs> But there was slavery. <laughs> and that was a problem. Yeah. But the Civil War solved that. But then there was racism. And that was a problem. But then the Civil Rights Movement solved that. And then we beat the Russians. And now we're here. Like, and that's, yeah. that's basically it. That's Isaac's the history level 101. Of, yep. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah in American history in like three sentences. But you know, um, your show here was too complicated for history. That, And yet, exactly what we're talking about. Is why we don't understand our history. And so, we, in a sense, you know, I mean, I'm glad you you all are doing it. You're, you're bringing it, you know, into, into podcasts. We're trying to complicate the world, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so sorry for the interruption, but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors. That you brought up, I have two things that I would love to to talk to you about. One, um, since the afterword uh, that you wrote in this book, it was written right before the movie came out. I'd love to get into that, but. In that same afterward, you mentioned it earlier, and in that same afterwards, you were talking about this, you know, the mixed race community. Yes. That was the creation of Newt Knight himself. And I found your conception or on the way you were laying out what the the sort of how complicated it genuinely is to exist in the uh, in the United States being of mixed heritage uh, was really well put. Uh, in just a few pages, I, oh. I really appreciate that because also oh, I'm I'm half East Indian and half Irish, so it is something not obviously not into the same uh, sphere as someone who is you know of mixed African descent uh, experiences. But there is a little bit of sort of like living in multiple worlds. The understanding of that the, the outside perception of you is partly what defines you and your reaction to that. It was really interesting the way you put it, and I I thought it was well uh, put. You stated that you don't say that someone is black just because they are of mixed heritage unless they particularly identify in that. Yeah, well, but thank you so much. Interesting well. I myself, I mean, there, as I've often pointed out, there are really two stories here, but there's, you know, there's the, there's the civil war unionism and there's the mixed race and the story of racial identity story. And mm-hmm. you can't really separate them. And yet they each have their own components to them that do have to look to, be looked at individually. And I myself, I feel like, and, and a lot of this came from talking to the descendants and really listening to them uh, and, and then reading all I could and, 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 try, and really understanding race in America and, and the, the, the whole race-based slavery could, could exist is that you had to define race yourself. I mean, Mm -hmm. people in power, those with power had to define race in such a way that allowed them to have plenty of slaves. If you what if we'd have taken the one drop rule of of race and put it and put it on the opposite and said, if you have one drop of white, you know, ancestry, because we know it's not a drop of blood. But let's say you have a sliver of white ancestry. Shouldn't you be free then? Right. Slavery is all about uh, black people being unable to really be civilized in any other way anyway you know all the justifications mm-hmm. they came up for with for it mm-hmm. um none of them work when you actually look at slavery and see you know that that many people were of, of, of various ancestries it couldn't be any other way uh after generation by generation by generation and so they had to come up with this system where uh slavery is determined by the mother if the mother's a slave the child's a slave and of course the assumption is if the mother's a slave she's black what is she? And what about the right. father of her child? Right. You know, and of course, we know very often it was the slave master himself, if not some other, you know, white male. And then there's, of course, white women. They think they think as long as they make the slaves uh, determined by the status of the mother, then, then white women can be the preservers of this pure white race. 
But mm. white women cross the color line too, mm-hmm. not nearly to the degree that white men do because white men are raping and exploiting black women. But white women cross that line too. So then you begin to have an ever-growing number of free African-Americans because they're born to free mothers. And right. that fascinated me because I began to see that in an earlier book that I wrote on North Carolina is I thought, this is really interesting. The whole uh, development of the free black class of people is because people are crossing the color line. And if you're born, if your mother's free, you're free, no matter how dark you right. are. So really slavery, the whole idea that slavery can be equated with blackness is one of the central myths of history. Hmm. There are lots of white people who are slaves. They may not have even thought of themselves as white. Right. But when I say yep. white, I just mean their skin was white. Mm-hmm. Because aren't we, it seems to me like we're supposed to all be in agreement now that race is not really a biological reality, that we're not really separate races anyway. Mm-hmm. We're separate ethnicities that influence the way we look. But the big lie of slavery was that there was an essential quality or lack of quality according to whether you were African or European. Right, Uh, those inherent differences. Unless you believe that essentialism, then you can't believe that slavery was ever rationally, really, truly about race. Race was, I mean, the concept of race was a way to enslave people. Right. So I'm interested. I mean, we've been talking about Newt Knight and we've been talking about his uh, band or his group of individuals who created this this group that became the Free State of Jones. Um, And you said they were interracial. So I'm assuming, you know, do you have free blacks and also maybe runaway enslaved people who was a part of of uh, Newt Knight's group? And you mean the actual band itself? Yeah, the actual band. Yeah. So did you have enslaved people who were running away? I mean, because the, I guess there weren't a lot of enslaved people in that county. No, there weren't. So was it this free? Is the thing. Now, the movie, the, this is where the where the movie, I think, I would have preferred, if I were the movie maker, not to have uh, given the impression that that uh, those maroons joined the band. Right. Even though, um, you know, I have no difficulty believing that Newt Knight and, and many of the other men interacted with slaves on the on the uh, Pearl or the Leaf River, just mm-hmm. like we were talking about when we began uh, tonight about the d- dismal swamp. Mm-hmm. But and still we should probably all, mention that that Newt Knight is is Matthew McConaughey for the for the moviegoers, yeah, so they yeah. can get that connection. Yeah, it looks just <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but there were not that many slaves. And re- when I looked at the census, mm-hmm. there was only one free black in, in Jones County in 1860. But the slaves that were involved, and there were some very prominent ones, of course, Rachel is the most prominent one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there was also the, uh, Martha Hatton and uh, later Martha Wheeler. She lived to be 100 years old, and she gave one of the be- best and longest ex-slave narratives in 1936 that I've ever seen. Oh, wow. She talked so much to her interviewer that they didn't even publish all of hers. You know, and I found the unpublished one. So she runs throughout Free State of Jones because she tells the story. She she was enslaved by Newt Knight's grandfather. But the way I understand it, I by the way, I I interviewed her descendants here not too long ago and wrote a a blog post on that. It didn't make it into the book because it wasn't until 2016 after the movie came out. They got a hold of me. And so uh, they told me how. Their understanding was that uh, the night slaves often were moved from household to household. And so these were the slaves that really aided Newt Knight. Rachel Knight was one of them. Mm -hmm. The movie Mm -hmm. doesn't have her as part of the Knight family slaves, but she was. And uh, I mean, they made what what perfect spies and supplier of food and that sort of thing for the uh, for the men of the band. So these slaves who I think were generally uh, people they had already grown up with, they knew as children. Certainly, I, I, I'm sure Newt Knight knew Rachel from the time they were both kids. Right. Mm-hmm. And, of course, they, too, knew that this was in their interest, just, just as these yeoman farmers knew it wasn't in their interest to go off and fight for slavery. They knew that it was in their interest to support that side of the family. Right. You know, and they did. And they did. And, uh, but I, I, if, I've got the roster of the 55 men that Newt Knight sued to get compensation for. There are no black men in there. There are no women listed at all. These are the men mm-hmm. who he, you know, that were in the swamp with him in his camps and, okay. you know, armed and, and fought against the Confederacy. So my sense is, and I have no evidence to suggest otherwise, is it was a totally, uh, it was a band of white men. 
Now, there may have been some mixed race men in there. In fact, one of the band members, I did notice in the census that there was some suggestion of, of being mixed race in his family. So that is hmm. possible. And so you know, your question is a good one. And given that I was the one who was making this whole you know, talk about how race is kind of this illusion anyway. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and and there has been some suggestion of that, that some of the families had had mixed backgrounds. Even James Street suggested that in his novel. Mm -hmm. And so it may be that there was more knowledge of, of their own history than we really even realized, because after all, this is mo mostly an oral culture. Right. That could have been part of it as well. And to be honest, you know, the, uh, the racial identity that someone adopts, I mean, like you said, might just be whatever it is in their best interest at the time, you know? Absolutely. Right. The, the, you were talking about pass, you were talking about a little bit about afterward about passing uh, and what that means for someone. And, you know, if you could, why wouldn't you, if you were, you know, of if course. it benefited you yeah. in that particular scenario. And it was accepted it, within the family as well. I mean, one right. of the things is one, uh, these three daughters of, uh, they were the granddaughters of Rachel. They all identified differently. One of them was, was, was white in Texas and was the manager of a Hilton hotel. This would have been in the early 20th century. Uh, another one taught the school right there in Jones County. And the other one was a missionary for the Seventh-day Adventists. And she was the one who brought education back to the mixed race community in the early 20th century. They all had very different lives. And the thing is, the one who identified as white set for a portrait with one of them who was identified as black, whether she liked it or not, because she lived in Jones County where everybody knew her genealogy. And so it didn't even necessarily divide the families. Florence Blaylock, who was my, my major contact among the descendants of, of Rachel and Newt, told me about how if you could pass, you did. Why wouldn't you? You could go to the next town and get a job. Exactly. You know? right. And she talked about how sometimes the, the bus would be coming. Here we'd be standing there, pass us by every time. Mm -hmm. And my my uh, cousin would say, I'm sorry, I'm going to go on the other side of the street or I'm going to go to the other bus stop because I got to get on this bus. He could pass. She said, I couldn't. I had darker skin. Right. So there was that, too. You know, not everybody could pass. And in the families, I began to realize they accepted uh, some of them accepted that. Yeah, if my brother can do it, he's going to do it. But others did not accept it. It also created divisions. There were actually as Florence pointed out to me, we have black knights, brown knights, and white knights, and we're all descended from Rachel and Newt, but we all mm -hmm. identify differently. Oh, wow. And so uh, when when the Davis Knight trial, when Davis Knight, the great-grandson of Rachel and Newt and Serena, he was also her great-grandson, when he was uh, charged with miscegenation, marrying across the color line, when he married a, a white woman from the neighboring county, uh, there were... The, some of the brown knights, I don't know if they consider themselves the brown knights or the black knights, but they were they were just glad because they were tired of seeing him pass for white, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it did create divisions right. among some of them. Yeah, uh, it's it's a, it's like we said, it's a very complicated but fascinating story, and it does come down to exactly what you were saying. Of course, during these times, if you could pass. You might not, uh, you know, not everybody did, but who, the, who would, who would, I, I have never understood how anybody would, would, would make that a moral issue that you went, you are white. If you're, if your skin is white, you are white. If you, if race isn't really an objective reality and you can pass, of course, you can also see that it becomes a cultural thing where you don't want to, you know, leave your family. You don't want to right. uh, have something that they can't have. And I understand right. that too. Right. All of it is very complicated and understandable. I think the decision not to do it and the decision to, uh, you know, be the color that your skin says you are. Yeah. And it, it, it's all a response to external circumstances. Like you said, it's not a real mm -hmm. thing that exists within a particular person. There are true, like all of those answers are correct. They are all of those things. Yes. Um, yeah. And that's super common for, you know, descendants, people from the same family to sort of present differently. And, and you know, like my sister and I present differently. Uh, mm -hmm. She passes more easily than I do, um, you know, and it's just a, it's just a thing, you know, and it, and yeah. it, it's super common. So it sounds like you've experienced much the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh, something that I'm very interested in. Um, yeah. Just just from exploring my own, because a lot of what we're doing and a lot, most of the vast majority of our conversations have to do with American history. <laughs> um, so where I fit into that is uh, is an interesting question in the eyes of some. Uh, but not necessarily something that I like, you know, my internal identity sort of tracks it. But it's, mm -hmm. it is something that informs a lot of my reading of history. 
um, you know, we had a, a recent conversation uh, um, about uh, uh, with a historian named Rosemary Zagari about uh, Thomas Law. And he brought with him two mixed Indian kids who are the same ethnicity sort of mix as I am. Uh, and that was the first time I'd ever heard of someone who was like exactly like mine being stamped into American history that early. And I was fascinated by it. Um, but I think it's because it's important because it does for those who have to sort of navigate those things, the racial identity in a way that isn't the default, sort of the, the standard person, you know, a, a white passing, you know, Protestant male, uh, if we're just to make a generalization for most of American history, it is part of what informs how you move through the world. So it's a big part of your life, whether you want it to be or not, whether it's real or not. Um, But this is such an interesting family, the Knights, um, because of how how many of them there were. (laughs) And, you know, how how they sort of were spread across that strata. Uh, It's a really interesting American story. And that that leads to uh, another sort of line of of interest that continues throughout our episodes and it's what it what does it mean to be an american and so we're always looking at you know the definitions of or how people define their americanness even to today you know what what does that you know what does that encapsulate what makes you an american and everybody has different ideas and you know different concepts and you know, that's something that we talked about in one of our other episodes, but we're always sort of leaning back to that in probably all of our conversations. And well, even now, important. you know, you say this, you know, Newt Knight, he becomes, you know, an American hero. Well, you know, American, you know, so that's the, okay, what makes him quintessential American? And so that's sort of what ties into all our historical what discussions. I like it, it, with Newt Knight, what I would like to see more of, again, that we didn't see in the movie is what makes him an American is that he really is a part of this community. The, this uprising, what I what I try to emphasize is this is a community uprising. And somehow Newt Knight rises within that community to be the leader. And that is really true. They elected him the leader. And yet the more prominent unionist was Jasper Collins and his brothers. But Jasper Collins seems to have been perfectly fine with Newt Knight being, you know, their captain. And, and so there again, that's, a, that's a story of, of, of what makes a person an American, what made him a leader, what he represented to them and how they all saw themselves. Somehow it all came together. And so I'd love to hear some of the discussions you had in that, uh, in that earlier one. Is that one that's going to be shown? Uh, yes, it is. It's actually our first now? episode. Yes. You um, haven't started showing them yet, have you? Right. No, they haven't started airing yet. Yeah, um, yeah. It was a, a, a we were talking about the creation of American identity, like around the inception of the revolution, um, with uh, Dr. Lindsay Trevinsky. It was a really interesting conversation, um, and a, had a lot of modern reflection on America of today because she's lived all over the country, um, and you know she's lived in the South, she's lived in the Northeast, she's she's from California, so she had a lot of insight into sort of like you know how disparate our nation really is, like how right. different it is. Well, I'll be sure and watch that. I, I do have a question about the movie since you brought it up again. And mm-hmm. and one of the, since I am personally, and, and both being the only non-PhD in the uh, <laughs> video call at the moment, um, <laughs> I'm engaged in sort of a non-academic pursuit of the exploration of history, so the like popular history. Um, and I was thought mm-hmm. it interesting in your afterward um, the it was the most actually the reason I, I bought this edition of the book is because I previously read an older edition and, and that hadn't had it so it's the, that's why it's a little fresh in my mind but it's you were sort of made a preemptive apology for um, a lack of historical accuracy uh, in it mm-hmm. I but did <laughs> at the same time sort of made a case for the importance of that exploration of this kind of storytelling and this sort of, could you uh, elaborate? It seems the movies, this is, this, could you elaborate a little bit of response to Cause this, that was written before the movie came out. So, you know, now we're a few mm-hmm. years past. I'm curious if your opinions and, and, and sort of what your reflections are. Well, yeah, you're right. Uh, I was in contact with, with, with Gary Ross, the director and, and screenwriter mm-hmm. uh, or script writer of the, of, of the whole screenplay. It's there was a journey to this movie coming out that was actually it's hard for me to believe now, but it was close to, oh, about six years long. At first, I was very excited that the movie was going to be made. And then 
a more popular book was written by John Stouffer and uh, host Sally Jenkins. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, it was not a pleasant experience for me because I read their book before I saw the movie and their movie was written from the script. What, what it was, was it was, uh, it was uh, Universal Studios was going to make it then it later STX made it, but they were going to, they were trying to um, market the mm -hmm. movie by writing a more popular right. version right. of the mm -hmm. free state of Jones. And it was not historically accurate in a lot of places. Parts, lots of it was, but lots of it wasn't. And I think what I was really struggling with when I wrote that uh, that that afterward was that I was very critical of that book for writing absolutely some absolutely false things in there. In one place, even citing me as the source. And so when the I wasn't real happy about the movie coming out, but then. I got to know the director and I got to understand that movies have to do, you know, have to encapsulate in two and a half hours with action, really, mm -hmm. rather than words right. on a page, certainly. And I also came to appreciate when I saw the screening of the movie, how much they captured with, with the hounds running through, you know, the, the, the scenery, the war scene, the opening with that war scene where you really see the horror and the death of mm -hmm. war. In other words, I liked the movie. Even though I have some caveats of things that I would have done differently, I still liked the movie. I never liked the Stover and Jenkins book. <laughs> and I think what I was doing in there was working out in my mind, there's a historian's book and there's a movie. And this book that was created in between, I thought, was irresponsible. Right. Because... It was presented as though it was it was touted as America uh, American history at its finest and all of this, and it wasn't. Mm. It was deliberately inaccurate to fit the script, and I'll never be able to forgive that, you know, or to or to sanction that. And it seems like it was completely unnecessary because you see the movie, and then because it's always a struggle for me too that I want to see the you know I want to see these things depicted, and I understand that they can't be one hundred percent accurate. So I always, I look at them as this is a jumping off point. We're going to get people interested in the free state of Jones and then they're going to go and they're going to read right. your book. I don't want another book that's going to be easier to read, but completely historically inaccurate to be sort of waving in front of them yeah. to grab and instead. most people won't read that the script was given to them. I mean, they say in their foreword that, that, that Gary Ross came to them and Random House and they all had a meeting and he presented them with the script. So if you're, if you're, you know, if you're, really thinking about how this came about rather than just what the story is, you realize the story is based on the script. Right. Right. And, not the other way around. You know, it's not, but most people I do believe if they get, if they come upon that book first, they think that the movie was based on that. Mm -hmm. And so there you have the whole story then, even in its so-called historical form is not accurate. And that, so, you know, it, it, to get back to my, my afterward, uh, I mean, I ended up getting along fine with Gary Ross. And like I said, I like the movie and I can, I can even go with the parts that I would have preferred not to see. It's a movie, it's Hollywood. It has to be exciting and people really like it. And it did inform people about unionism from a class perspective. Right. I love mm -hmm. that. I just love that. So those, you know, I, I was, you could, you, what you picked up on, uh, Isaac, is that I was kind of struggling with it and trying to work it out. <laughs> and I hope I did. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's something that I picked on, Paul, because I'm acutely aware of it in, especially when we're talking about the other, some of the documentaries that we're working on, um, that I have to do work to convince this historian that I'm speaking to be like, hey, please be on camera. I'm not going to misrepresent your research. There's yeah. just an inherent distrust with this kind of popular history adaptation of when we're taking, you know, academic work, really scholarly work, and then, you know, making it palatable or putting it into a different form. Um, and that comes with some compromises. Um, and the whole hope is that you make the right, from my perspective, is as a, as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, is you make the right compromises. And you make ones that are, don't hurt uh, someone's understanding of history if they misinterpret it. Yeah. Well, we're on the same page. I mean, that's yeah. that's that's where I'm coming from in that, uh, and I'm trying to do it in a very, you know, careful way. And yeah, but, but I, yeah, I heard in your that. voice what a lot of historians say to me, and they're like, you know, I understand that you're going to have to do some things, and you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sort of like, that fear. <laughs> I really learned what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, you know, there's that fear of we understand that you can edit. 
And so there's always that, how is it going to be edited? And yeah. you know, that fear For of, sure. you know, how, how will it be changed? But, yeah. you know, like you said, there's certain things that, you know, they're, they're wolves in Jeep's clothing where there, there's a lot of mm-hmm. history books, quote unquote. I'm not going to name any names, but like Lynn and I, have, I mean, I even I found it when in my reading when we were doing some research, inaccuracies in Pulitzer Prize winning books. With that, no footnotes. You know, ref, yeah, well, yeah <laughs> foot, a, foot, a footnote that leads to a hundred year old book that has no footnotes mm-hmm. in it. So it's a, like a, just a, like a scholarly dead end and yeah. really shouldn't be presented as fact. If you're, really, I agree. if you're nitpicking, I certainly agree. Yeah, that was that was quite an experience for me to go from the the depths of of, of a book appropriating. I mean, they used all my I had I had put all my my uh, notes and resources and interviews at the University of Southern Mississippi, and they're all cited in there and everything. Mm-hmm. But it's just that what what they wanted to say, they still said. Yep. And right. uh, it was it was it was a very difficult time. And then when the movie came back out, I just wasn't sure if I wanted to see it. And and what was really wonderful was that I came around to where I did enjoy the movie, and I had a good relationship with Gary Ross after that. We we kind of talked it out. <laughs> That's great because I I genuinely do think there is a value in popular history. Uh, Absolutely, and sort of I do. That, that there's a, a value of broadening an audience and an interest in it because you know who else is gonna uh, why else would anyone look into this? Yeah, right. <laughs> and and it, I, I, I agree with that. And, and uh, it's, it's just, it takes skill. I mean, it's not something where you can just, oh, I'll just hit the high spots here and everybody knows about it now. I mean, I think it's, a, it's, it's quite a skill. I would love to be able to write more popular history. In fact, one of the things after the movie came out is I wished I had written The Free State of Jones in a, in a more, shall we say, accessible way. You know, it's an academic work. I had no mm-hmm. idea that a, that a movie producer would, would discover it and say, this is a story I want to tell. Um, but then again, I think it's probably good that I didn't because I think academically I wrote the book that I should have written. It's just that what, what happened was lots of people ran to read my book after the movie came out. And then, of course, so many of them said, this is boring, the movie. Like the movie. <laughs> so my actual, you know, the five stars that Amazon gets you, mine actually yeah. went down with star oh, after no. the movie came out. No, no. Like the book wasn't exciting like the movie was. But I've gotten over that. That's, that's years in the past. But now. the trained historians, <laughs> they thank you and they, get, they give you five stars. Because we love the footnotes. <laughs> and then, yeah. That's a ton of Christmas presents that were given out to people. And then they went to, they're like, you love the movie. Here's the book. And like, oh my like goodness. Like, I have to read. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. But they each have their place. The scholarly work needs to be done Absolutely. as a foundation for understanding. That's right. Kind of yeah. It has its place because it does. I mean, it's, it's the kind of stories you're telling. They're complicated. Yep. There's, mm-hmm. there's just no, I mean, the thing that I always remember when I think, gee, I wish my book was, you know, a little bit more accessible to the public, I realize it's too complicated a story to have been written that way. And that's why I, you know, I mean, I'm not a popular writer anyway, but, but I couldn't have done that. That's a story I don't think could have been told easily. As well, you're popular in this crowd. I'll say that. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, it's really been, I mean, you really read that, that afterward so carefully and, uh, I like the way, I mean, I, these are, these are issues that I really haven't actually discussed that much. They don't often oh. come up. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's been cathartic for me. <laughs> yeah. They're not new afterwards. Don't get published all the time. So it's watching, true. like yeah. seeing an author reflect on their work after a certain period of time, when it's in a period of transition is interesting. I was excited that it was there. And I was like, oh. oh, that's a big and interesting little tidbit to, to, to dial into. And it was more interesting than I thought it would be. Oh, well, so great. Go buy the new I really appreciate that. that yes. makes me feel you, very good. Yeah, even if you have the old version, go buy, go buy the, the new, new version. Ones, there's, there's, there's worthwhile <laughs> stuff in there. Is there anything else that we would um, uh, we could point our audience to go check out any of your work, uh, any of your more current work? Well, you, actually, like to... uh, the book that I wrote following that, it actually came out ahead of the movie, The Long Shadow of the Civil War, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Southern Descent. Uh, in the old, uh, in the news, I can't even remember my own byline, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the long shadow of the Civil War. It came out in 2010, and I actually, at that point, I was working on Texas uh, Unionists, and I had finally decided I just I was working on the big thicket Unionists, and I had finally decided I really couldn't get a book out of them. But then I wanted so badly to compare North Carolina. Mississippi and Texas, and that's what I did. And it's a series of essays. And the other thing it allowed me to do was to go back and revisit Newt Knight and do a sequel. And I really covered his whole 
efforts for the during those 30 years to uh, to get compensation from the government for him and his 50 in 55 of the men who he said held out true. Um, so and I also took the um, the mixed race community into the 20th century. So there's a whole essay on those sisters that I mentioned. Oh, Anna nice. And Leslie and Grace. Oh, very so, cool. I just think that uh, if people are really interested in the, in these stories, as, as we've all talked about it, because it also gets into the Davis Knight trial, further into that, mm -hmm. it's a nice sequel. But it also looks at at North Carolina and, and Texas as well. You know, the Texas uh, Big Thicket deserters were actually uh, headed by the brothers of Jasper Collins. So in a sense, they're they're a related band in Texas. Uh, Warren Jacob Collins was the brother of uh, of, of Jasper Collins, and it's a small yet world. it's a it's a very wow. different story, yeah. Wow. With similarities. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bynum. Uh, I'll give Dr. Victoria Bynum yes. in case you're trying to look her up. <laughs> <laughs> this was, thank uh, you so much for having me. This, this has been great fun, and and I really appreciate your questions and and your comments as well. So it's a, a great experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you for listening to the full episode of Too Complicated for History. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, please leave us a review on Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to follow us on our social media platforms at 2C4H underscore podcast, or check out the link in the description. This will keep you in the loop for show updates, new episodes, and exclusive content. Too Complicated for History is a podcast from Primary Source Media, produced by Patrick Long and Lynn Price Robbins, edited and mixed by Curtis Fritsch, opening theme music by Sheena Biratella.